Hello, and welcome to Hey Boomer. My name is Wendy Green, and I am your host for Hey Boomer. I love that new music, so soothing. So I hope you guys like it. Anyway, at Hey Boomer, we are changing the conversation about getting older. We are redefining it as not declining, but seeing it as a time for exploration and self-expression and learning. And with that in mind, get ready to embark with me on an incredible journey by becoming a boomer believer. So what is in it for you to be a boomer believer? Well, first of all, you're going to get to join me once a month to talk to one of my podcast guests and ask them all the questions that you wanted to ask and you were sitting there waiting for me to ask and oops, maybe I didn't get to them. So you can join with a guest once a month. You can also join our Boomer Banter once a month where we get together as a community and we talk about all kinds of interesting and inspiring things. We do exercises, group work, and we learn and grow and build a sense of community and support in that. You're also going to get to sport a new Hey Boomer designer baseball cap, which is also fun. You'll get a shout out on the podcast that you have become a member of the Boomer Believer tribe. And you will also get a shout out on your birthday because you are worth celebrating. So mark your calendars. The inaugural Boomer Believer event is going to be on January 30th at 6.30 Eastern time. And we will feature a captivating conversation with Dean King, the author of The Feud, The Real Story of the Hatfields and McCoys. So that should be fun and interesting. Come with your questions. Join us as a Boomer Believer. It's just $25 a month for all of that. And you can join by going to buymeacoffee.com slash heyboomer0413. Sign up now. It's going to be great. Okay. We're talking today, like we've been doing this week, we've, this month, we've been talking about family dynamics. And today we're talking about estrangement. And recent research has shown that about 27% of people in the United States are estranged from at least one family member. 27% translates to about 67 million people in the United States. That's a staggering number. And it may be a low number. We'll see. I don't know. In the episode with Dr. Joshua Coleman, he shared his story of being estranged from his adult daughter. So it happens in all types of families, well-educated, moderately educated, high income, low income, all races, it happens. And people rarely talk about estrangement because there's a sense of shame and guilt and confusion. And I, I don't know why this is happening to me and what did I do and all of that. So people don't want to talk about it. But in today's episode, both Dr. Janet Steinkamp and myself will share a little bit about our personal stories. So my story completely caught me off guard. Um, my son and I have always been very close. And I had really no idea that there were issues that he was struggling with and hadn't talk to me about. So I was completely surprised over Thanksgiving when my son and I had a huge falling out and he brought up the threat that if I did not change my ways, I would not be invited to his house. Like seriously, first of all, who does that to their parent? And, and second of all, like, really? You're, you're saying that to me? Oh my God, I'm your mom. I was shocked and I didn't understand. And I couldn't really talk to him because he was so angry at that point that it was better for me to just leave and let everything calm down. And over time, it did seem to calm down. We, we talked on the phone a few times, never really brought up 
what had happened, just having nice conversations. And then um, about a week ago, I went back up to his house to celebrate my granddaughter's sweet 16 birthday. And I thought we had a great time. We laughed and we ate and the whole family was involved and I didn't feel any tension at all. And I came home like, yes, that was great. Things really went well. Until about two days later, I got a text from him that said, I had done something wrong again. It didn't, it didn't, he didn't even say what it was. It just said, I'm warning you, mom. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Of course, it upset me. My stomach was upset. I was feeling all anxious. I was like beyond confused. And fortunately, this time we were able to have a more calm conversation about what he was trying to get me to understand. And I am grateful for that. It was not comfortable. It was not something that I necessarily even agreed with, but I understood his point of view. And, and so I am really trying hard to make some of the changes that he wants me to make so that he feels comfortable that I am not imposing my, my opinions or whatever on his family. And I hope that we never get to the point of a complete estrangement, but it is feeling like walking on eggshells a little bit right now. So with that story and with Janet here, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let me do a quick introduction of you, Janet, and then let's dive in because we got stuff to talk about. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, as I said, you know, it's about 27% of the people in the U.S. is what the findings show. Could be more. But I'm hopeful that what we learned from Dr. Steinkamp today will be helpful to all of us, whether you're experience, experiencing estrangement now or maybe you might in the future or you know someone who is. But Dr. Steinkamp is an educator, a teacher trainer, communication expert, estrangement consultant, a researcher, and a mom. In conjunction with several professional roles, she spent her career of 25 plus years working with people to develop effective individual and group communication skills and establish healthy relationships. In 2019, Dr. Steinkamp began her own journey through a family estrangement when her adult daughter, decided to cut ties. Her family lost contact with her daughter for nearly two years. It took months of courageous self-reflection, sometimes painful self-accountability, determination and grace to understand how her communication and expectations contributed to her daughter's estrangement. When asked how she got started on her journey of growth and transformation, she quickly points out that the first step was to recognize that the only person she could change was herself. To assist as you navigate your estrangement circumstances, Dr. Steinkamp created the When Our Adult Children Walk Away website, and I'm going to share that link later, where people, particularly parents, can find resources and support services. Oh, boy. All right. So do you want to start by giving us a little background on your story? Sure. I'd, I'd be glad to share. First, I want to say thank you for having me. This is such an important topic for so many people. And really, it's difficult to find reliable resources. So I appreciate this. Um, yes. So my experience with estrangement did begin in about 2019. If my daughter Brianna were here, she would say it started for her in her early 20s. So she's 31 now. So that means her estrangement journey really began over 10 years ago. Our experiences are very different in estrangement between parents and adult children. Um, so really, um, I, I, there's so many complicating factors. The fact is, I was a helicopter mom. 
I was way deep engaged in her life. Didn't really give her time or room to make mistakes or have opinions. Um, in fact, I didn't even give her space to clean her room. You know, I just kind of <laughs> took over everything. Uh, and what I've learned since then in her own therapy is that she's been diagnosed as attention deficit. So I was so involved. I didn't even recognize the symptoms. I didn't give her time. I didn't give her space. So as she grew up and started to try to disengage and put me in my new parent role, <laughs> I really fought that. I really fought it. Um, she chose a partner who, um, pretty obvious to us as her parents, was not a good match. Uh, very different life trajectory, different values. Um, and uh, he really didn't want us in her life. And so if you uh, listen to Josh Coleman and look at the cult of one, that was really our experience. Mm -hmm. But it would be easy for me to say that was the problem. But I, actually, the, it was my parenting that opened us up to estrangement. Had she met him and we had a healthier relationship, I think she may have had um, the grounding to be able to avoid some of the difficulties that she that she experienced, who knows? I mean, I, I can only um, look at that and, and make an educated guess. Doesn't mean she didn't make mistakes, she did. Mm -hmm. she, her expectations were, I thought, kind of over the top. And if she were here, she would chuckle if she heard me say that. Her expectations um, of you or the boy? Oh, of us, of life, yeah. of, you know, yeah. what she was entitled to. She was raised in a pretty uh, easy lifestyle. So she got accustomed to things, you know, being available to her easily. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, she's 31 and she's trying to rebuild her life, 10 years of that. Um, so, so here we are. Um, she now lives with us with her twin uh, six-year-olds and um, it is still eggshells. It's not as brittle. Mm -hmm. Things aren't, the cracks aren't quite as loud and we've created some trust. I call it a social bank account where we have some basic bus um, trust deposits made. So when we do make mistakes, we can forgive each other and it, it's not as risky. We don't, we're not on that edge of estrangement, the final um, mm. complete estrangement. So, yeah. so you said she, it started for you in 2019 and been going on for her for 10 years. Did you have any awareness that she was struggling with this? Oh, sure. Oh, oh you sure. Did. When I okay. look back, sure. She was very vocal. She wrote us letters. She, she would say to me, I mean, I can chuckle now. It wasn't, it's not funny. I, she would say to me, mom, not everything is about you. Starting when she was about 17, mom, not everything is about you. And I would laugh it off and say, well, really in this instance, it is kind of about me. Hmm. And that works when they're young. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it's true. As she matured and grew, I did not change my parenting style. Mm -hmm. So she's 25 and saying that, and I'm still not hearing her. Mm -hmm. I'm still not listening. And um, I, she gave us lots of chances. Um, yeah, she did. She yeah, did. I think, I think you know, I, I hear this and I've said it myself. It's like, I was a good parent. I don't mm -hmm. understand. You mm -hmm. know, how can you push me away? I, I, I don't understand. Like, how, how do we even begin this journey of trying to understand when we're feeling like we were a good parent? We're being misunderstood. There's something messed up here. Right. You know, often we hear the word rejection from parents. I'm suddenly being rejected. My role is being usurped by someone else or um, I'm kind of getting pushed to the back of the room and my voice doesn't matter as much anymore. And Really, if you look at parenting, our goal is to to raise independent adults. Mm -hmm. And there is a cost to us, and that means our voice isn't as loud. And if we're lucky, we can find a way to at least still be heard and not um, not be alienated because we're not adjusting. Mm -hmm. I call it um, partner parents. So instead of being the predominant decision maker or influence, we step back and become their partner in life. Yeah. That's tough. We, that's tough. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it is tough. It is yeah. tough because we have been so used to being the parent in charge, you know, mm -hmm. and um, 
And I know that, you know, there are times that my mother, who's 93, gives me advice on I'm 70. And I'm like, Ma, I got this. You know, I've been doing <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. But I think it kind of comes naturally, you know, and we it is a big change. So you have a tool that you think helps with this communication. Um, can you give me some more information on that? Sure. I use the, the Wiley, it's a particular um, development or uh, marketer owner, uh, the DISC. So, um, DISC, D I S C. D -I -S -C. Exactly. It's an acronym. Uh, it's in the, the letters really represent the four different communication styles that we identify uh, when we have someone take the DISC assessment. We get um, some re results from that that tell us your primary communication style. And then from there, we can really dig into it and look at what your strengths are, what your style is, um, how you might be perceived by someone else, and how you might take in information from other people so you can understand where the disconnects may be, where mm -hmm. things align. Uh, and it's really very powerful. It's not the only tool. There are plenty of different assessments out there. It's the tool that I've chosen and I have found to be really, really helpful. So can you tell me what the letters stand for? Sure. So the D is dominance. It's an unfor unfortunate word because it sounds pretty overpowering. <laughs> I happen to be a D. I'm a strong D and I can be pretty overpowering. <laughs> so I, that, that's a fact. So D, I is influence. So the influencer tends to be more of the cheerleader, more kind of um, animated. They might be the head of, you know, the the person with the great story when the meeting's getting started or at the Thanksgiving table. Um, S is steadiness. Uh, the steady person really is focused on maintaining consistency. They're going to be quiet. They're going to speak more slowly. They're going to want time to absorb and really process information and be very, very invested in keeping the relationship alive. Hmm. They don't like disruption. Uh, so you, just as an example, if you take a D and you take someone who's got an S style, you can see where that there may be some disconnects there just right off the bat. Sure, right? yeah. And then the C is conscientious. So the conscientious person in their communication style is really, really focused on accuracy, data, answers to their questions. They want to know why, when, who, how. And it's very difficult for them to get past um, and really listen to the other person until they have that information. Hmm. So again, you can see if there was somebody with sort of um, an I style who's more animated, uh, life of the party, talking with somebody with a C style who really wants the information, you're <laughs> going to have a disconnect because one person's going really fast and, and trying to be... Um, uh, uh, heard and related to, and the other person is really wanting data. You know, give me the facts, give me the facts. Mm -hmm. What did I say? When did it happen? Why was that a problem? And really, those data points may not be important to that mm -hmm. other person. So it's really helpful. And that's just the tip of the iceberg with the disc. What we want to do is when we learn our own style, and we learn more about the four different general styles, uh, we can start understanding what our child's style might be and then looking at ways where we may be overwhelming them or not. They're not feeling listened to because they want the data and we don't want, we don't want, we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about our feelings. Yeah. So um, it just really helps give context. None of it is bad. No, no style is more important or more valuable or better. We all have strengths and we also have challenges in our style. So I could go on for the, with this for hours. I love the disc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Philip, who's listening, says he's a huge advocate of the disc too. So wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about at the very beginning that the only person you can change is yourself. So, your child, your adult child comes to you and says, look, you need to stop doing X, Y, and Z, or I'm not going to 
let you into the house. I'm not going to let you talk to my kids. I'm not going to let you whatever. That's right. <clears throat> um, we're shocked. We're, you know, hurt. We're what, mm -hmm. how, how do we start even, I mean, if, if they won't even talk to us, let's say, how do we even start to know what it is that we need to change? Right. Right. So, um, I would say in my own experience, I started there. I, I don't understand what I've done wrong. If you would only listen to me, life would be so much easier for you. Right. And as I really sat down and had some frank conversations with myself, I don't think I was being quite transparent with myself. If, mm. if I really looked at it, there were some things I knew probably were pretty irritating and actually disrespectful. You know, I'm criticizing her partner to her. And it's not that I was wrong in what I, in my opinion, it's that it wasn't my place to say it. It wasn't my place to, she wasn't asking for my opinion. Oh, I know. And so it's the, the translation of that is disrespect. And that wasn't my intention at all. My intention was try to save her. Right. Um, and so the more I let myself sort of, get comfortable with those things. I realized there were things I wanted to change regardless if whether those were the things she would point at hmm. because I didn't like them about myself. I didn't, I didn't want that to be how I came across to her. Her, her relationship wouldn't survive that, you know, her partner wasn't going to tolerate that. So I think there's a lot of, um, Self-reflection sounds so easy. It's not. It's one of the most difficult things. And especially with the D style, that does not come naturally to me. I don't really, frankly, I, I got to get my work done. And if other people don't like it, I still got to get my, my work done. You know? <laughs> I don't slow down for much. But I've learned that the S style is probably my greatest advocate and friend. Because if I watch someone with, with an S style and meter myself to them, to how they're interacting with people, I learn a lot. I learn a lot about how I'm not, what I'm not hearing, what I'm not seeing. Um, so again, I think that this can really help us with that. So on a practical point to your question, if I, when I hear your story about your son, this might be a time if I can use you as an example. If, sure. If you're okay with that, sure. Mm -hmm. This might be a time to say to him, you know, I I want to I want to take a minute and learn more about my own communication style because I hear you. I hear it's not working for you. The last thing I want is to cause trouble. So I'm going to take a minute and do a little bit of work, and you know, it might make it might take me a few weeks. You know, you may not hear from me as often. I'm right here. I'm not mad. I'm not angry. It's just that I got to work on myself for a few weeks really get a hold of what's going on here. And then I do some self-work. Mm -hmm. You know, I might start with um, some uh, books on tape. That's my own thing. I like to, to walk and listen. I hear things better if I'm in motion. Podcasts. Oh, yes. So <laughs> we call that a kinetic learner. You mm -hmm. learn better if you can absorb things while you're moving. So take a few weeks. And my guess is that's going to earn you some trust with him. It's going to earn you some credibility with him because you're listening, you're taking responsibility for yourself and, and you're really going to invest your time and energy in, in discovering more about yourself. And then at the end, you take the disc in there somewhere, get some, a couple hours of interpretation of the results. Um, there are lots of good podcasts about the disc videos. Um, and and then when you circle back, you, you might be in a spot where you can process with him. Maybe yeah. he would take the disc and you Maybe. could have a conversation. Maybe, yeah. Know. That could be but helpful. Take the bull by the horns. Take the bull by your horns. It's scary. It is, it scary, is scary to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's scary because I don't want him to get angry again and whatever. But, um, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, on, your, on your website, when, mm -hmm. when adult children walk away, um, you have some really good video recordings on there or audio recordings on there. And um, one of them 
I think you talk about, um, you know, that, that we're going to have to do these things and you just said it again, it, but our children are going to have to start developing a trust in us again. Right. So I, I guess I have two questions around this. First of all, I, I get it that it's my responsibility to make some of the changes myself and to do mm -hmm. some self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Part of that question is, do they have any responsibility in making the change or giving us the opportunity to make the change. And, and then, like you said, you know, the walking on eggshells, how do you, do you ever get past that and feel like, yeah. you know, you're not going to step in the hole and make a mistake again? Mm. Yeah. Those eggshells, they're brittle. <laughs> they are brutal and they're brittle and they're loud. Um, well, there, there are a couple of things in what you've just asked. So the first is to, how to develop that trust. And yes, I would say they do have a responsibility to give us time and space to get on board, to get with the program, to make the changes they're asking us to make. Now, they have a choice. They can say yes or no. The good news for us as parents is that the research demonstrates over and over again our adult children do not want to be estranged. They're, they're not happy to be estranged. They may be relieved. The preference is to be connected. It's a natural part of our biology. Our, um, our fundamental character drives to be connected to other people and to our families. So we've got that going for us. We are still more powerful than we understand. And it's been my experience that when adult children recognize that their parents are genuinely, now it's, it has to be genuine, mm -hmm. invested in, in starting to understand what kind of changes we need to make, they do give us space, they do give us room, and they do give us grace. And we have to be smart enough to take it. It's tough, Wendy, that is brutal. It's brutal. It's brutal. It is. And yeah. So... Yeah, a couple of one of the things that I did was for myself, I would get up every morning. And once I got through those first three stages of grief, the disbelief, which you're describing, the anger, and the despair, and I could start accepting my new circumstances, I would get up every morning and I would and I would picture in my head, if my daughter came to my front door, knocked on the front door, I opened it, said like, good morning. And she said, good morning, can I come in? I would ask myself, what's my decision? Because I get to decide that. What is my decision today? Hmm. And I base that on my readiness. Am I ready to be successful in the changes she's asking me to make? There were a lot of mornings I would say, yeah, no, I couldn't because the risk was too great. I wasn't ready. So I would, in that instance, I would imagine myself, you know, let's step outside and have a cup of coffee in the sunshine and just chat. And then off we would go to have our days. On the days when I started feeling like I'd made the changes and really grown into the person I thought I, I needed to be for her, I would invite her in. And it took months to get there. Months, months. Yeah, that's interesting. I've been trying to reframe it in my mind mm -hmm. um, in two ways. One to say, well, you know, I don't have to parent anymore. Uh, that's not my job anymore. So mm -hmm. I don't need to share my advice, my wisdom, my whatever I think I have to improve them. You know, they don't need that from me. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I believe that all they, my children really need from me at this point is you're okay. That's right. I trust you. Yeah. I respect you. You're okay. And, and that's all. They don't want my advice, which mm -hmm. I guess makes me a little sad because I turn to my parents for advice, but it is what it is these days. Is that right? Is that what you see? Yeah. And your advice is probably really good. <laughs> You know, if they would listen, right? If they would just listen. Right. Yeah, yeah, yes. So asking questions, that's that's your best friend. A question mark is your best friend. Um, stick with 
with, um, you know, what, uh, how can I be of help? Is there anything I can do today to make your load a little lighter? Um, I'd stay away from why. Why questions typically lead to guilt. Yeah, right? or defense, yeah. Yep, or to, to defense, exactly. And I love what you said about, you know, I, I trust you. I have confidence in you. And I want you to have confidence in yourself. Mm. You're, gr you're great. Mm. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. And very few mistakes can't be repaired, you know? They, yeah. Even if you make a mistake, what's the greatest, what's the greatest risk here? And if you stick in that, in that corner, you're more likely for them to feel validated, encouraged, supported, loved. You believe in them. And then we have to zip it. That's zip what my it. grandson says to me. Mimi, zip it. At six right, years old. It. <laughs> I know. And then I call my 91-year-old mom. We're very fortunate to have our moms. And I, you know, you're not going to believe what just happened. Dot, 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 dot. Yep. And she very patiently listens and then talks about Rumi Cube or whatever she's doing with her day. I don't know. She's a great role model, but yeah. See, and that's the thing also, I think, is the listening, the active mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. And when we're feeling attacked, the last thing we want to do is so, so what I hear you saying is, that yeah. you don't like that I give you advice. No. It was no. like, what? <laughs> no, it's not genuine. It's not sincere. They see right through it. Yeah. Actually, um, I want I, I want to say this. I do have this new seven-part series coming out on grief, estrangement grief, my model. Um, and, and I really think, Wendy, in those first three stages of grief, we're not at our best. You know, the, the disbelief, which is really what you're describing, that first stage of grief. You're recognizing your vulnerability, the vulnerability of your relationship. That's a big, big change. Then we move into anger, despair, and we, we swirl around in that just minute by minute. And our emotional regulation is at its worst. We're weakest. We're most likely to snap. We're not able to really disengage and and be that rational, mature adult parent. It's not our best time. So, so it's important for us to recognize how grief impacts our communication and our vulnerability to making things worse. You know, the, the bargaining, the pleading, the begging, the questions, the threats, the anger, the, you know, the tit for tat kind of back and forth that we get into. We, we check into our own child, you know, we, we're not at our best. So yeah. um, I just want to encourage you because I do hear you in that first stage. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's really powerful to think about it that way, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was listening to some of your mm -hmm. series. I think it's really well done. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a comment here from Steve that made me think of another question. Steve says, they may not want to hear your advice, but they'll hear it and maybe use it later in life. So my question, and this is based on just anecdotal evidence, we as moms are more emotionally involved and, and our kids may find it easier to say to us, back off, than they find it with dads. Do you think that's true or is that just my impression? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first, I think my husband would say he's more emotionally involved than I am. He's a strong I. He's a relator, and I'm a D. So I'm much more. I move faster. That doesn't. But I. But your point is good. We tend to have a more uh, primary role in the nurturing and relation relational aspect of the family, as as moms. Um, I would say, in general, we tend to let the people we have the most faith in that we know are at the the what, least risk of leaving, we tend to let them have it more because we're more confident they're not going to walk away. Does that make sense? So I'm much more likely to say nasty things to my mom because she's not going anywhere. You know, she's dedicated to me till the day either one of us dies. So it's not that I'm proud of the things I say or that I want to be mean to her. It's just that that's the safest relationship. 
to let my stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, the people that are I love and care about that are more likely to say, I don't need to take this. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. That's probably not where I'm going to reveal my most deep fears and insecurities. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think just by nature of our family dynamics, moms are more likely to get it. Dads are actually more likely to be estranged. That's mm. what the research shows. Interesting. So, okay. Whether that's by the dad's choice or the adult child's, um, it, the, the dads are more likely to be estranged and for longer periods of time. That's interesting because I, when I think about my family, I mean, there's no way we would have spoken back to our father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no problem with telling mom. Yeah, the consequences. Oh my gosh. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what about when we live far away from our adult children? And, yeah. you know, in some ways, it's easier for them to mm -hmm. keep that distance and, and harder for us to try and establish that caring relationship. So, any suggestions for having, having, building bridges when they're far away? Yeah. I think of that as a geo estrangement. You know, we use our geography um, and, and some of that is natural and normal. I mean, there was a four year period of time. I didn't see my brother. We talked, we weren't estranged. We had busy separate lives. Um, and that was okay. You know, it, um, I don't know that either one of us felt that was a bad thing. Now, um, he, so why do I say that? Because he wouldn't necessarily have known that. I could have hidden behind that, been mm -hmm. furious with him about something, mm -hmm. and he never would have known we were estranged. Mm -hmm. he, it's just the, ge the, um, the geography. Um, and families do tend to move apart these days. It's much more likely that people will relocate. Um, and, and we do have busy lives. So Again, to me, that's that's an, a great opportunity for healthy communication. Okay, we're, we're, we're separating. So, you know, what's going to be realistic? Can we call you once a week? Can we um, have a, a family happy hour on Friday nights? Can we, you know, how can we stay connected? So you actually sort some of that out on the front end. And that protects parents in so, to some degree because I can text my children in a day if I'm having a boring day, don't have a lot going on, and I miss my kids, I can text them 10, 12 times in a day. <laughs> you know, it's insane if you're the one getting like, the text. Stop. I know, make it stop. <laughs> so right. I finally got to the point I could, I said to them, I must be driving you crazy when I think about this. And they just laughed and looked at each other and kind of rolled their eyes. And, <laughs> and the response was, I thought, pretty brilliant. Mom, you can text us all you want, but don't expect a reply. Ah. You, you, you know, there might be a text in all of that that we can reply to. You might get yeah. a thumbs up, but just don't ex keep your expectations realistic. It's not that you can't text us. And of course, then I know I need to back down on my texts because it's not reasonable. If you're working, yeah. you've got a busy <clears throat> life. Yeah. 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 And and I think one of the challenges today too is that. Everybody has a cell phone, you know, yes, the, the, I don't know about your six year olds, but all the teens that are in my family have cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so it used to be we would call my grandparents, everybody would get on the phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now yeah. you call each one individually. So I like your idea of, hey, let's do a family Zoom, let's say, and five minutes. I mean, it doesn't have to be a long time just to check in. Yep. Yep. See, if you are a visual person, you know, we have like five basic learning styles, uh, you know, audio, uh, the hearing, seeing, touching, you know, the, so if you're someone who really needs to see people that a FaceTime five, 10 minutes is a huge, huge thing for you. If you need to hear their voice, a phone call might work. Um, some people like to write letters. They're much more, you know, there's a kinetic aspect. You're seeing the words on the paper. It's much more personal for some people. Now, you might get an email back. It may not be a handwritten note. Um, 
But the nice thing about that, Janet, though, is that they have time to think about it and process Mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. You're not confronting them, so to say. Yeah. Yeah. What I learned about writing letters is to take a picture because once it's gone and they have it, they can refer to it and I can't see it anymore. So I don't know what they're talking about. So I learned after writing letters to take pictures of them. That's a really good idea. Um, Joanne, I see what you're saying. We can take that offline, but good luck with all of what you're going through right now. Um, Yeah, so this, I want to tell people how they can find you, Janet, because I think what you're offering is super important and um, you're very caring in the way that, you know, the conversations I've had with you have been really, I felt heard and cared for. So I appreciate that. Um, Janet's website is whenouradultchildrenwalkaway.com. Um, She does have resources on there, including the uh, audio series that she's setting up that I think was really helpful for me. I appreciated that it was there. Yeah. And you can also email Janet at Janet at J.E. Steinkamp, which is S-T-E-I-N-K-A-M-P dot com. All of this will be in the show notes, too. So, um, boy, I would encourage you as you're going through anything like this to reach out to Janet, check out her website and, um, have a conversation. Are there, are there two or three takeaways you'd like to leave with us before we end the show? Yeah. Um, first of all, you're not alone. You are not alone. I think if the research were done again today and people were feeling, um, not so uh, vulnerable, we would find out that the percentage of people with estranged relationships is much higher than 27%. It's just so much more common. Um, not any less painful or scary. It's just more common. So you're, you, we really aren't alone in this. Um, and then I would, I would actually extend an invitation because I have not found yet the best way to get people together to talk about this. Um, I hosted some book clubs in 2023. They were not all that popular. I love book clubs, but not everybody Mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very interested in getting some feedback from people about what would be most helpful. You know, an open mic night, um, coffee club, you know, what would it be to get people together? And then I'd be more than happy that you don't have to pay me to talk about this disc. There's a way to sign up for some time with me. That's there's no cost. And then we can talk more about what might be helpful to you as individuals and for your family. So I'm not, I'm not out to make a lot of money. I mean, I have to pay my bills, but um, yeah, I mean, I just think this is really important work. It is. And and I so appreciate what you're doing and what you just offered. I think that's beautiful. So, um, and I appreciate all the comments and questions that came in on the, on the chat and Janet and I will look at that when the show is over, if there's anybody that needs an individual answer, we will get back to you. Um, I also hope that you guys will consider becoming a boomer believer by going to buymeacoffee.com slash heyboomer0413 and have the opportunity to speak with one of our guests over a Zoom every month. Um, Let's see. We're going to finish this this series on estrangement, talking about friends. So we all have had that experience where we've had a good friend for a long time and then all of a sudden things start drifting away or things change and you start to feel like it's a toxic relationship. It's not good for you anymore, but there's a sense of loss, kind of that grief that Janet was talking about. When someone's been a friend for a while, there is a sense of loss when they're suddenly gone from your life. So next week, we're going to be talking to Margie Zabel Fisher, who I found um, when she published an article titled How to Prevent Being Estranged from a Friend. She's um, a a regular contributor to many uh, online publications, and I think you will find that that episode very, very interesting and helpful also. So continue to embrace this time of your life with exploration, self-expression, and fulfillment, and self-care. 
So the Hey Boomer Show is produced by me, Wendy Green, and the music was written by and performed by Griffin Hunrado, who is a student at the North Carolina University School of the Arts and my grandson. So (laughs) I love that. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And good luck on your continuing journey. Yeah, thank you.